uh, to each and every one of you hardy souls who has braved the snowpocalypse. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me the kind of uh, hysteria that seizes the Washington metro area but, uh, in, in advance of a snowstorm. But we're grateful that you came out this morning, and uh, we're looking forward to, to marking the, the birthdays of both George Washington and Abraham Lincoln today, both of whom uh, celebrate February birthdays. Indeed, uh, we'll have President's Day in a, a little over a week's time. And it's good to recall that, that Congress still, uh, and by law, marks that as George Washington's birthday. We intend to do that today as well. My name is David Bob. I direct the Kirby Center, Hillsdale College. We're fresh off a, a, an event that was held last weekend called the Constitution Town Hall. Uh, some of you uh, may have uh, participated in that because it, while held in Chantilly, Virginia, it was uh, available online. Uh, it still is. Uh, it's uh, archived at constitutiontownhall.com if you wish to uh, check out that uh, event. We had more than uh, 33,000 people register for the event, and uh, that number has continued to grow as, as people are expressing a real interest in, in uh, thinking about the principles of the, of the Constitution and the duties, really, of, of citizenship. The Kirby Center exists to do just that, to educate Americans about the principles and practices of American constitutionalism. Uh, the Kirby Center, based here in Washington, is a program of Hillsdale College, a school that was founded in 1844. Hillsdale is committed to constitutionalism in that uh, all of its students take a course on the US Constitution. You can find the reader that those students use online at the, the kirbycenter.org, uh, the Kirby Center's website. You can also find out more information about Hillsdale's uh, other programs. There are programs for teachers, including a seminar coming up in April on Hillsdale's campus, and other things that have just been announced for the summer, a series of uh, hostels and other uh, programs for, for, for citizens. I would also uh, just mention to you that the First Principles on First Friday series will continue in March, and we're pleased that Andrew McCarthy from National Online, National Review Institute, and formerly the lead prosecutor in the uh, Blind Shake case in New York City. Somebody who's been writing a great deal, very busy in the last couple of uh, weeks, especially covering the Obama administration and terrorism. He's going to speak on the topic, America at war, or is it? That's the question, really, that we have to confront. Are we at war against Islamic uh, radicalism? And if so, what does that war constitute? So that is Friday, March 5th, same time and same place as this morning's talk. This morning, we're really pleased to have with us a member of Hillsdale College's faculty, an assistant professor of history. Terrence Moore is a lieutenant in the Marine Corps. I use the present tense because I am told that uh, once a Marine, always a Marine. Uh, you can tell that uh, from the way that Dr. Moore conducts his classes, but he does so with not only the uh, uh, the, the good and uh, proper severity that uh, the, the, the topics he teaches require, but also an appreciation of the fact that the liberal arts really do lead to liberty. And for eight years, he directed the Ridgeview Classical Schools as principal. He was founding principal of that school, which was uh, recognized by publications both in Colorado and around the country as amongst the leading schools. And it need not just recognize, but it really did achieve that. It's a school, a public school, a public charter school, that achieved significant results in what the students were learning. And it did so by instructing them in the great books. Uh, Dr. Moore, I'm sure, would be happy to tell you more about that in the question and answer period. But this morning, he's here to, to speak to our two leading statesmen in America's history learning from Washington and Lincoln. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Terrence Moore. All right, well, thank you. Please, if you're joining us, just come on in. We have plenty of seats. Glad you all could make it. I'm told there's going to be a snowstorm. Um, I work in Michigan. Every day is a snowstorm. <laughs> Um, but that's all right. The, the more days that Washington doesn't work, the better the rest of the country could be. <laughs> At any rate, let's talk about education, and specifically Washington and Lincoln's education. 
currently, the most popular way of thinking on the matter of public education reform and the way adopted by the present administration, a logic, I'm afraid, shared by too many of those who claim to be on the right of the political spectrum, runs something like this. Jobs are important. We are in danger of losing jobs to overseas competitors. Schools ought to prepare young people for jobs. The kids graduating from schools today are not prepared for jobs, the employers tell us. The teachers tell us that they cannot do their jobs with the money they are given. And we all know that teachers, the salt of the earth, are the most underpaid profession in the world. So we need to spend a lot more money on public education so we can create a competitive workforce for the 21st century and the global economy. The jobs of the 21st century require a lot of skills since we now live in the information age. There's so much information out there. So we need to make sure there's a lot of skill training in this education. Other than that, we don't know too much about education. Let the professionals take care of that, the details. We'll sign the checks. This is the substance of all that has been said from the political classes on the subject of public education for the last 20 years. The only difference between the right and the left on education is that the right occasionally throws in the term choice. And at the local level, in a very few places in this country, they actually provide a measure of choice. Too often, however, as we may discuss later, this choice has no teeth. What worries me, however, is that the Obama administration now appears to embrace choice, specifically in its friendliness toward charter schools attended by the poorest minority students. Can the left have finally seen the light? Don't count on it. Rather, the left, still controlled by the public school establishment, has learned to manipulate the desire for choice on the part of the parents and politicians alike in order to funnel even more money into the abyss that is the public school system. And the money will continue to flow from hardworking taxpayers to bad schools as long as the logic, the train of thought that I have outlined, remains unchallenged. The most obvious flaw in the logic is beginning with jobs and moving backwards to dictate what ought to be required of education. The argument is flawed in this respect for several reasons. First, though jobs are no doubt an important factor in the happiness of a person's life or in a nation's flourishing, they're not everything. By equating education to job worthiness, we cut out all the other areas of life, such as political understanding or moral capacity or the faculty of language or the ability to love another human being and any number of other things that make up your life and my life, the hours of the week we're not working and that guide our intellectual and moral compasses as we do work. In fact, the chief thinker in the West who equated a person's job with his happiness in life and his quality of mind was none other than Karl Marx. <laughs> Second, all the hullabaloo and hand-wringing about skills for a 21st century workforce plays right into the hands of the public school establishment. Since no one can define what those skills are, the schools cannot be held accountable and we are allowed to experiment wildly with any theory that emerges from the schools of education. Worries about the job market cause politicians to throw money at the problem. When the worries increase during an economic downturn or collapse, education is the one area no one has the audacity to cut. Worse still, the rhetoric of skills allows public schools to continue to do what they have for the past 60 years or more. Ignore content based on knowledge of the time-tested subjects of history, literature, physics, trigonometry, grammar, and so on. The third flaw in the logic is the most critical. Looking at a particular type of job or whole economy of jobs now existing in order to shape the education system is the most static view of education and the most static view of economy anyone can offer. No one can tell us, not Steve Jobs, not Bill Gates, not Jack Welch, and assuredly not President Obama, what sort of jobs will be available 18 years from now when my four-year-old will hit the job market. Considering skills as the only entrance to the job market, even very high skills, is akin to thinking recent high school and college graduates show up every year at a big hotel, each one with a coded key, 
each one trying to get his key to work in some door or other. If one key never works, if the code has expired, that person doesn't get a room. He has to go back to the drawing board and redo his entire training, education, or whatever we call it now. While no doubt skills at a higher level play some part, these skills ought to rest on some fundamental learning that allows people not just to adapt to an ever-changing market, but to make that market for themselves. In other words, jobs do not make the human mind. The human mind makes jobs. When a man's mind is well-trained, he is not limited to the jobs that are out there. He puts himself in demand since there is never a glut of people who can think. My point is, instead, that instead of getting lost in the fog of skills and jobs for the 21st century and the global economy and all this claptrap, it's in uh, Obama's education uh, agenda. Uh, with training human minds in the sure subjects at the school level, subjects that have been tested in every information age, we need to be occupied. This is what has made every information age, every industrial age, every enlightened age in history. The training of mind that in fact created those ages. Our question should not be how do we train young people for jobs, but rather how do we train a human mind? What does a well-trained mind look like? What are the very minimum things everyone should know? How much would a minimal education cost and how long should it last? To answer some of these questions, it seems we might do well for once to consult that surest guide relied upon by the founding fathers of this nation. The lamp of experience, as they called it. That is, history. We have living examples of minds that solved problems, that used critical thinking, that ushered us out of one age and into another, a better age. I have in mind the two greatest presidents in American history, and arguably the two greatest men. Those presidents and men are George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. The one was the indispensable man in that great revolution which transformed 13 separate colonies into a united nation and a constitutional order that became the envy of the world and has arguably done more good in the world than any regime, past or present. The other redeemed that nation from its original sin, the blight of slavery that controlled the economy and eventually the political culture of one half of it. Might we learn from these two figures what minimum education is required to do great things in the world? The first astonishing fact we have to contend with is that neither Washington nor Lincoln was given any special advantages in their early education. Every person in this room has had more schooling than Washington and Lincoln combined. In fact, we could throw in the third greatest man in American history, in my opinion, Benjamin Franklin, we could throw him into the mix and still come up with less formal schooling for all three than what any of us would have had by the time we finished middle school. Moreover, the amount of money spent on the schooling of all three for what we would now call the high school age was exactly zero. None of them went to college, though there were excellent colleges to go to in both the 18th and 19th centuries in America. The paucity of our three greatest men's schooling should chasten a nation that spends untold billions every year on public education with negligible results. A nation, by the way, that teaches its young people very little about the amazing lives of its three greatest and unschooled men who are living proof of the possibility of democracy. You see, the lack of school experience for these men exposes what the favorite philosopher of the Founding Fathers John Locke called a false association of ideas. A false association is a connection, a relationship in the mind that gets into a person's head because he has grown up with two things being constantly connected in everyday speech, though these two things have nothing to do with each other. In our case, one of the greatest false associations of our time is that between education and the one hand and public schools on the other. The two, in fact, have, at least in our time, not in all of history, but in our time, no connection whatsoever. <laughs> the lives of Washington and Lincoln prove that you can get an education without going to school. And the lives of almost every single young person today, whether living in an inner city 
or in the much vaunted suburbs, prove you can go to school and not get an education. <laughs> we should begin with Washington's early education. We know little about it. The most significant event in the young Washington's life, the death of his father, when the young George was 11, ruined the young man's chances of attending the Appleby School in England, as his father and two older half-brothers had done before him. The exact nature of the young Washington's early education is unclear. It probably consisted in some training in uh, reading and writing under the tutelage of private masters. He also attended a school of a sort for a short time, we think. Yet the most we said of his education is what it lacked, an intense study of the ancient languages that his fellow Virginians, Mason, Jefferson, and Madison, to name only a few, enjoyed, as a preparation for further training in the languages and the formal study of philosophy in college. No doubt Washington was reading and forming the elegant writing style that now spans over 40 volumes of his complete works, probably using some of the same text written in English that the better education Jefferson and Madison would use. There is, for example, a reference in a copy book of Washington's to his reading in an unspecified English history up to the reign, the reign of King John, and also reading in The Spectator, Number one, up to uh, number 143. Addison and Steele's Spectator, of course, was a favorite for every boy in the English-speaking world. And we need only look to Franklin's autobiography to see how that uh, great work could have been internalized and also how it could have formed a person's writing style. Uh, because we know so little about Washington's education, it explains in part why uh, so much attention has been placed on the young Washington's most famous writing assignment. His copying down, uh, sometime before the age of 16, we think, the now celebrated rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversation. In fact, you have a copy of these. I made sure everybody has a text in front of them. I'm a college teacher, and if people don't have a text in front of them, I get very, very nervous. <laughs> if you haven't done the reading, that's okay. Many of my students haven't done reading when they come to class either. The writing of these 110 rules, which modern teachers would consider a tedious exercise lacking in spontaneity and imagination, may have served as an exercise in penmanship. We cannot forget that good handwriting was far more important in an age that lacked even the typewriter, to say nothing of the computer. Uh, the inculcation of speech through explicit acquisition of polite words and phrases uh, is clearly a part of this exercise, and we'll look at some of those phrases later but, of course, later, but of course that's something else that's been abandoned by the public schools. Uh, moreover, the words and phrases of the rules impart a vocabulary and style of speech. The committing of these sentences to paper, though, offers a small illustration of a much larger educational culture and habit of mind in the 18th century. The belief that there were thoughts to be mastered, often passed down to us from a previous age, whose purpose was to guide our conduct as we made our way in the world. To this end, most every young gentleman kept close at hand what was then called a commonplace book, a book in which were written down particularly apt or striking thoughts out of books read either in study or for pleasure. The idea is that a thought committed to paper, capable of being reviewed from time to time, will stick in the mind, become a habit, serve a man his entire life. These thoughts might have been, as their name suggests, commonplaces. Sometimes they were taken from great passages in literature, while at others from simple texts, such as this list of rules Washington wrote dating from the Renaissance. We should realize, however, that what to an adult seems obvious, even commonplace, to a boy may be a revelation. Another word for commonplace, in short, is wisdom. Let's look at Washington's rules of civility. Some of these are howlers. My favorite is number 13. Just turn the page, it's at the top. Kill no vermin, as fleas, lice, ticks, etc., in the sight of others. If you see any filth or thick spittle, put your foot dexterously upon it. If it be upon the clothes of your companion, put it off privately. And if it be upon your own clothes, return thanks to him who puts it off. Some of the Hillsdale students who were here on their internship, they had 
uh, some fleas and ticks and lice and thick spittle on their clothes, but they all put it off <laughs> privately before you enter the room. <laughs> this rule teaches us as much about pre-industrial hygiene as it does about manners. We can easily cherry-pick our way through the rules and have some good laughs. Yet, when we divest ourselves of our own prejudices against the backwardness of those times in so many ways, we see a larger moral purpose. Look at the first rule and then the last. The first rule, every action done in company ought to be done with some sign of respect to those who are present. And the last rule, labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. Do these pithy statements not offer the whole reason for and goal of polite manners? and place them in their proper frame of civilized life. The outer respect shown to those that are present will eventually become an internal habit of soul. As a Renaissance axiom has it, manners maketh the man. Seen from this perspective, these rules become eminently practical. Take a look at number 12, right at the bottom of the first page. What does bedew no man's faith with your face with your spittle amount to, if not offense against close talkers? <laughs> and therefore it's morally essential. Shake not the head, roll not the eyes, lift not one eyebrow higher than the other, wry not the mouth. All serve as necessary injunctions against what we mean we might call today teenage attitude. <laughs> Anyone who has been around teenagers has seen eyes roll and eyebrows lifted, signs of being put out with rules and settled forms of conduct. In Washington's world, young men were ushered into their roles as men by means of pithy maxims seared into their memories. It would not be too much to say, moreover, that while Washington clearly did not have the education of his contemporaries, so much so that in one of the snarkiest comments to be found among the founding fathers, a rather jealous John Adams stated that Washington was too illiterate, unread, unlearned for his station and reputation. The young Washington was in no way outclassed in his reading and mastery of maxims for conduct in life. In fact, Washington in his adult life showed a kind of genius for maxims, and these, combined with his early training in surveying, which amounts to applied geometry, the favorite mathematics of the Greeks. And the strength of, my, strength of mind required to run a successful plantation comprising many thousands of acres. These proved to be all the early education Washington needed to fit very well into his station and reputation, notwithstanding the snipes of John Adams, who always ended up playing second fiddle. <laughs> of course, later in life, Washington did need to undertake a crash course in the principles of natural law under the tutelage of his fellow Virginian and author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, George Mason. <clears throat> but perhaps we'll explore that on another occasion. Now, there are at least two things to be said here about maxims. The first is that while maxims do not constitute a philosophy, they do give us first principles. Principles that can be applied to a variety of circumstances throughout one's life. Let us take one example of Washington's reliance upon maxims that at first appears fairly innocuous, but in truth may have had historical consequences. Writing to his nephew and na namesake, George Steptoe Washington, who was then 16, the uncle offers this advice. He's writing a letter. At this crisis, your conduct will attract the notice of those who are about you. And as the first impressions are generally the most lasting, your doings now may mark the leading traits of your character throughout life. It is therefore absolutely necessary, if you were to make any figure upon the stage, that you should take the first steps right. Washington goes on to urge his nephew to acquire, quote, a habit of industry and a disrelish of that profusion of money and dissipation of time which are ever attendant upon idleness. Washington devotes a large part of the letter to discouraging the lad not to spend too much money on clothing. At any rate, all the marks of maxim inculcation are here, common phrases such as first impressions and first steps. The metaphor of the stage as a man's place in life, 
one of Washington's favorite metaphors. And the emphasis on the importance of what Jefferson would call a decent respect to the opinions of mankind. Though solid advice, the letter would strike us as no more than commonplace were it not written by George Washington. But then there is the matter of the date. The 23rd of March, 1789. That's just five weeks before George Washington will be inaugurated as the first president of the United States, the first president of its kind in history. So I'm going to reread read this letter and think about this. We're five weeks away from the inauguration. At this crisis, your conduct will attract the notice of those who are about you. And as the first impressions are generally the most lasting, your doings now may mark the leading traits of your character throughout life. It is therefore absolutely necessary if you were to make any figure upon the stage that you should take the first steps right. There is, to be sure, in Washington's world, a crisis at hand. The crisis of whether a young nation can establish itself among the community of nations. Washington and the entire nation are upon the stage trying to prove that their maxims of conduct will prove viable. Even more telling, the new nation suffers from chronic debt. Its character would be ruined if it cannot get out of debt. It can hardly afford either a profusion of money or a dissipation of time, given the massive challenges in taking the first steps toward a more perfect union. The maxims Washington internalized in youth that he is now passing on to his young nephew moments before he takes office will be the same that will guide his every move while establishing the character that is the American nation. Now, we might pause to reflect in any number of ways upon our own times. But I should only like to remark that, though I don't know that much about the early education of President Obama or Nancy Pelosi or Harry Reid, I am fairly certain that they missed the part about a disrelish of that profusion of money. <laughs> Another way we could ask this question is, what maxims do we live by? What metaphors do our children internalize in school that they will live for for the rest of their lives? What commonplace, what wisdom is imparted in school? If you go throughout this, if you just go through this little uh, writing exercise and you circle the moral words in it, you will come up with words such as unbecoming, evil, unjust, malice, envy, commendable, passion, reason. Are these, are these the words that we hear our young teenagers and folks in their early 20s using on occasion or with regularity? Let's go on to Lincoln. We must briefly say something of his education. The first thing that strikes us about Lincoln's education that struck all his contemporaries is how limited and even little encouraged it was. Lincoln had little access to schooling, little access to books, and until Sarah Bush Lincoln entered his life, his stepmother, at age 11, apparently little tolerance for his natural inclination for books. Our understanding of Lincoln's learning remains fixed by his self-deprecating account he provides in a campaign autobiography in 1859, in which he said he spent less than one full year in school and learned only reading, writing, and arithmetic or rather ciphering to the rule of three. The rule of three, by the way, is proportions. Uh, if three is to nine, uh, if, what, what, if three is to nine, then what is one unto blank? That's ciphering to the rule of three. Uh, interestingly enough, they do elementary algebra problems sometimes at tests. They did one at City University of New York the other day. 90% of the students failed. That's ciphering to the rule of three. At any rate, this little store of education which Lincoln speaks of had become far more impressive by the time he reached his memorable debates with Stephen Douglas or wrote his first inaugural. And no doubt it owed to his own proclivities and virtues. Yet we can also say a few things about Lincoln's education that re reach beyond one man or one epoch in our history. Perhaps we can even hold to a few self-evident truths about the nature of both education and democracy. 
I would hold that after the examples of Washington and Franklin proved to the world that while a truly liberal education, based on the classics, might be held from a child due to circumstance of birth or accident, I would hold that in a democracy, there is no reason why a child who has the least inkling for learning should not attain what was called in the 18th century a tolerable English education that would allow an adult to function and to thrive in the world in both his occupation and in the larger pursuits of citizenship and culture. The example of Lincoln reiterates what that education might consist in and how today's schools must be utterly failing in their duties by not providing at least the education that Lincoln had when this great democratic story of self-education is right before them. The inquiries into Lincoln's early education that were widespread in his time and in the histories written after the Civil War all ended up marveling at the abject poverty of his educational resources, his access to books, his attending schools by littles, as he put it, not adding up even to a year. In the 21st century, I think we should take a different tack. We should rather marvel at the richness of Lincoln's educational resources, even as we marvel at the poverty of our own in this much celebrated information age. Let's do a little experiment. This is a pretty educated audience. I'm sure we have a few degrees in here, probably from some of the best colleges and universities in the country. Some graduate degrees, professional degrees, and whatnot. We had growing up, even in advance of the internet, access to thousands, maybe tens of thousands of books. We spent a little more than a year in school. We probably spent 12 or 13 years in school. How does our primary or secondary education stack up to Lincoln's log cabin learning? We'll figure this out by a show of hands. How many of you, of us, before the age of 18, had read the whole of a complete edition of Aesop's Fables. A whole edition of Aesop's Fables. Hands, please. Okay? Lincoln had. Not just once, but dozens of times. How many of us had read the original Robin Crusoe, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe? Not a tamed down version, but the original. Three. Three of us. Lincoln had. More than once. How many of us had read Pilgrim's Progress in its entirety? Two. That's pretty good. Three. Lincoln had. How many of us had read from cover to cover and more than once the old Parson Weems' Life of Washington that is now mainly dismissed as a myth and is known only for the cherry tree that Washington didn't <laughs> chop down? Anybody read that? That was Lincoln's favorite book. Um, and how many of us had read most, if not all, of the King James version of the Bible, the one written in the age of Shakespeare, cover to cover, by the time you were 20? Oh, no. The King James version. Good. One person. Lincoln had. Uh, so this is not very impressive. I, I'm sorry to say, you should go back and demand your money back. Greece. <laughs> Lincoln's cadences and, cadences and speeches and in letters are proof that nothing informed his style more than that great moral and religious literary wonder, the King James Bible. Should I go on? Give Lincoln a little more time into his early 20s, and he will have mastered English grammar, Euclid, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution, while he continued to read fables and reflect upon the lives of Washington, Franklin, and Lincoln. No. Yeah. Yeah. And Jefferson. He reflected on his own life as well. He was self reflecting <laughs> He read all these things aloud, by the way, along with the speeches of Henry Clay, thus listening his way into a perfect command of the English language and internalizing the first principles of morality, politics, and freedom. Allow me one example, one example of what such an education could have instilled in a young boy on America's frontier. I'm going to give you an account of, I'm going to give you three accounts of Washington's crossing the Delaware. Uh, here's the first one, with which you could be familiar. You know, of course, that there was this crossing of the Delaware by Washington in order to take the Hessian outpost of Trenton and Princeton and thus uh, maintain patriot morale. This is in the close of 1776. Here's the first account. General Howe, firmly and luxuriously based in New York, established outposts in New Jersey and settled down to wait out the winter. 
Washington, however, was not yet ready to go into winter quarters. Instead, he seized the initiative. On Christmas night, 1776, he slipped across the icy Delaware with some 2,400 men. Near dawn at Trenton, the Americans surprised a garrison of 1,500 Hessians, German mercenaries, still befuddled from too much holiday rum. It was a total rout from which only 500 royal soldiers escaped, death, or captured. Only six of Washington's men were wounded, one of whom was Lieutenant James Monroe, the future president. This account was taken from the fourth edition of Tyndall and Shy's America, a narrative. Probably the most uh, popular companion text to university courses in American history and used by some of the AP teachers in high school. Though indisputably factually accurate, I ask you, where is the miracle in beating up some drunk Germans <laughs> while the British general is apparently kicking back in his own befuddlement in New York? We move on to the account given of Washington's crossing in probably the favorite text of rich suburban high schools and posh private day and boarding schools in this free country. Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. It's actually Dr. Bob's favorite uh, history, which he writes on frequently. Here he goes. Zinn's. The Americans lost the first battles of the war. Bunker Hill, Brooklyn Heights, Harlem Heights, the Deep South. They won small battles at Trenton, Trenton and Princeton, and then, in a turning point, a big battle at Saratoga, New York, in 1777. This short passage constitutes the bulk of the account of the war that gained American independence. It would take too much time to go into the errors of the specious listing of battles. Um, while we are given few words on the battles that won the war, we are treated to a nice account on this same page of how the military conflict crowded out other issues that were then going on. One of these issues being the distinction made between officers and men in Washington's army. New lords, new laws, offers Zen in quoting an unnamed chaplain. Now I ask you, if you, don't, if you haven't figured it out, Zen is a Marxist historian, uh, <laughs> and also, before he died the other day, a multimillionaire based on this text, which is read in our schools. I ask you, was Washington, commander of the Continental Army, with all his thousands of acres in Virginia, any less cold than his poorest private on that bitter night in 1776, when he personally supervised the Delaware crossing for hours on end when all was a blizzard, blizzard and in doubt? Uh, I forget to mention that um, this is also Matt Damon's favorite American history textbook. <laughs> of course. Now here's what Lincoln read in Weems' Life of Washington. Everything being in readiness by Christmas night, as soon as it was dark, they struck their tents and moved off in high spirits, once more to try their fortunes against an enemy long victorious. But alas, the enthusiasm of the gallant Calawada uh, Wallader and Ewing uh, was soon arrested, for on arriving at the river, they found it so filled with ice as to preclude all possibility of crossing. Thus, to their inexpressible, inexpressible grief was blasted the ardent wish to aid their beloved chief in this last bold attempt to save America. Ignorant of the failure of two-thirds of his plan, Washington, in his little forlorn hope, pressed on through the darksome night, pelted by an incessant storm of hail and snow. On approaching the river nine miles above Trenton, they heard their unwelcome, the unwelcome roar of ice, loud crashing along the angry flood. But the object before them was too vast to allow one thought about difficulties. The troops were instantly embarked, and after five hours of infinite toil and danger, landed, some of them frostbitten, on the same shores of the enemy. Forming the line, they renewed their march. You see the difference? The account continues, and we're actually given a reason for these more than human exertions. Pale and slowly moving along the neighboring hills was seen, by fancy's eye, the weeping genius of liberty. Driven from the rest of the world, she had fled to the wild woods of America as to an assured asylum of rest. Here she finally hoped, through long unfailing time, to see her children pursuing their cheerful toils, unstarved and uncrushed by the inhuman few. But alas, the inhuman few with fleets and armies had pursued her flight. One little band alone remained and now resolved to defend her or perish, were in rapid march to face her foes. 
This account is highly rhetorical and mythical. Indeed, it is veiled in a Bunyan-esque allegory of Lady Liberty being chased out of every land and hunted down. But I ask you, of the three accounts we have glanced at, which is the more accurate? The bare narrative of facts, or the brief mention of the battle framed by complaints against the military and social inequalities alleged by a Marxist living in luxury 200 years later, or the lyrical words of Parson Weems replete with heroism and an ultimate cause. Which one is truer? Which one captures the hardships, the hopes, and the ultimate ends of those men uh, who knew in that bitterly cold, history-changing night of December 1776 what was at stake not only for themselves but for millions yet unborn? We know the account given by Weems made an impression on Lincoln. On his way to becoming President of the United States, Lincoln passed through New Jersey and had this to say to the Senate of that state. May I be pardoned if upon this occasion I mention that way back in my childhood, the earliest days of my being able to read, I got hold of a small book, such as one as few of the younger members have ever seen, Weems's Life of Washington. I remember all the accounts there given of the battlefields and struggles for the liberties of the country. And none fix themselves upon my imagination so deeply as the struggle here at Trenton, New Jersey. The crossing of the river, the contest with the Hessians, the great hardships endured at that time, all fix themselves on my memory more than any single revolutionary event. And you all know, for you have all been boys, how these early impressions last longer than all the others. I recollect thinking then, boy even though I was, that there must have been something more than common that those men struggled for, that something even more than national independence, that something that held out a great promise to all the people in the world for all time to come. Lincoln's Reflections on Weems. Might Lincoln's boyhood reading been the source of those mystic cords of memory binding the nation together Lincoln spoke of in the first inaugural? If so, presumably, more men than Lincoln had those impressions forged into their memories and drew upon those memories marching into battle to save that genius of liberty who had been hunted around the globe and even in part of that great beacon of liberty, the United States. Which brings me to my final question. What memories of Washington, of Lincoln, of this nation, of liberty, constitute our early impressions in education? A man without any memories is like a man with amnesia. The world has, the world can only be a mystery to him. A man who develops in his youth a seething hatred for the place he calls home, though he may have skills, though he may have, by the standards of the day, an education, such a man can be nothing but dangerous. My thesis is that President Obama has become friendly to so-called schools of choice because he knows the potential uh, as such schools, and as he is a former and present community organizer, that such schools can be good, really good, at inculcating radical ideas. Uh, the virtue of the schools as they exist now, and the public schools have few virtues, is they're not doing anything particularly well. If they can't teach you how to read, they can't teach you how to be a good Marxist. But if schools of choice can become hotbeds of radicalism in the inner city, that could be a dangerous thing indeed. I think the right needs to spend more time talking about not only the choice that the school system ought to have, and indeed it needs choice, it needs to talk about the substance of the education that we should be embarking upon, and I would hope that that education has something to do with liberty. Thank you. So thank you for patiently listening. Um, any questions? Uh, this gentleman back here has one. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I refuse to let either of my daughters read any of Howard's in, but I was wondering um, what I should have replaced them, them with, or what books I should have recommended instead of them when they, when they were signs in, in, in high school. What would you have recommended? Well, that's a tough one because there, there is no good one volume American history textbook. Uh, there is the Patriots history now out, uh, which is good. Uh, if you really want to know what these men suffered, especially at Valley Forge, I would go back and read A Different People's History of the United States, one by Paige Smith. Are you familiar with that? It first came out in 17, uh, 1976. And I reread that over the summer. It is excellent on all the, all the battles in particular. It's, it's a first-class military history. Uh, and it, it's a narrative. Uh, it's long, uh, but young people have nothing other than time on their hands, as Lincoln proved. <laughs> Um, so get, get them away from their cell phones and, and give them those two thick volumes of Peg Smith. Other, yes, ma'am. I couldn't help but notice you using the, the phrase a well, um, well-trained mind. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if you had also read the book of the same title. And then along with that is the whole concept of classical education, um, which of course anchors kids in the classics and in, uh, in history and having kind of that that world view. And so, um, anyway, I mean, I'm, to me, this just seems like a perfect way to, to go in with these charter schools and make them classical schools. Um, obviously, with a very strong, as much as possible, to have Christians who are classically educated to give it that solid foundation. Because, of course, a classical school, you would be throwing out the public school textbooks and bringing in the classics, and then you could be selecting things that have the right world view along with that. Anyway. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am, I, I totally agree. I have read uh, the book, The Well-Trained Mind, which I say is written by the ladies wise, uh, Susan Wise Bauer and the other lady wise. Uh, they're, they're wise ladies, and classical education is very strong. I ran a classical school for seven years. It was a classical charter school. Uh, I will say that the classical schools and, and even the, the, the wise ladies make one mistake, uh, and that is they become so classical uh, they, they start churning out um, Latinists, uh, and they forget the American narrative. <laughs> if you look at some of the curriculum in these classical schools, they, they, they give kids the education that a Madison would have had, uh, but they don't give too much on the American story. And my version of classical education would be to build up and to make the American story, in fact, the, the premier thing. Uh, because classical education, to be truly classical, has to be an education in citizenship. Um, and so why, while we need the cultivation that was Rome, uh, we also need to be connected to our own civil polity, which is the United States. Um, th that's, that's my thought there. Uh, eventually, I think Hillsdale will have same things to say about that as we are starting our own initiative uh, in, in that realm. Yes, sir. This gentleman right here. Washington presided over the Constitutional Convention, and Lincoln was a self-constitutional scholar. Our current president is also a constitutional law professor, and he's so educated my, in my the So basic. Really. <laughs> I'm curious, like, as to your thoughts on the disparity and the huge difference between their understanding of the Constitution and his. Well, I'm glad you bring up bring that up because actually your question and the previous lady's question are entirely connected. Um, the attack on the, um, the public schools that had been pretty good in, in the early part of the 20th century was an attack waged by what we now call progressive education, which is an, a part of the progressive movement. Um, the other attack that took place was an attack on the Constitution, also a part of the progressive movement. So the kind of constitutional law that President Obama practiced at the University of Chicago Law School is not constitutional law in how we would understand that. Uh, it's, it's an anti-constitutional law. Similarly, uh, the education that the Founding Fathers had had, uh, which gets even better if you move past Washington and start looking at what Madison studied, um, that is also under attack because it's that well-ordered mind that leads to the understanding of natural law and a constitutional order that has to be attacked if the progressive movement is going to be uh, victorious. 
Um, so it's, it's not just that we've stumbled into some bad ideas in the public school system. Uh, it's that this is a conscious effort to, uh, to s lay siege to the mind that would come up with the sort of ideas that a Washington, a Jefferson, uh, or a Lincoln would have had. Um, so I, you, you, see, you see what I'm saying here? The, the, the term progressive, uh, either in progressive education or progressive politics, is uh, a, a conspiracy, I guess, to dismantle, dismantle the founding fathers and to completely change the language. Uh, now, they, they talk about rights, for example, but when, they, when they're talking about rights, they're not talking about natural rights as understood by Jefferson at Alia. They're talking about entitlements, which are things taken from people. So, and of course, you have to get entitlements, you have to take them from some people. And that means those people's rights have to be violated. See what I mean? Uh, we could go into this in some detail, but I'm going to go ahead and. Add. Is that enough for right now? Do you think that? I think that sums it up pretty well. Okay. All right. Good. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm wondering what your opinion is on the international baccalaureate curriculum. Um, personally, I think that it's uh, fairly complete. And do you see it eventually replacing the high school? Um, curriculum as it is right now. I'm going to try to be politic. Um, I understand that there's a little bit of variety in the international baccalaureate curriculum, but understand what it is. It's international. It's trying to be a world curriculum. Therefore, it's not situating itself in the American polity, uh, in the American experience. Now, the f I've known, I haven't looked at it systematically. Uh, but I do know parents of kids who have gone through it. Uh, and, and this could be the flavor of the place. It may not refer, refer to every IB program in the country, but I know that it can be extremely anti-American. And it can also be extremely anti-Christian uh, with the, you know, the, the, the promises, this flair of internationalism, which is very much a part of the Obama-esque rhetoric. Uh, in fact, I would say that the IB is the very opposite of what Jefferson had in mind when he started creating schools and colleges for Virginia. It's, it's actually based in the classics. And um, I guess the, the use of the word international to label it as they do in the United States. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I did the baccalaureate degree in um, Honduras. And uh, the education program, it, to me, it's very well-rounded, and it, it has a lot of foundation in the classics. Um, but it, I guess it, it may, very well may be that here it, it has been tainted. Um, uh, if I understand what you're saying, the IB program may be better abroad, uh, and in our own country it's turned into a way to, in some cases I know this to be true, bash America. Uh, so you could be very right. Um, I, I just I would not call it a classical education because a classical education is always rooted in one's own civil polity, um, and I don't know it to be based on the classics, meaning the learning that comes out of Greece and Rome. Maybe, maybe it is, um, but that's that's not what ends up happening in some of the districts that I know of that use IB. I should look at it more more in depth, but I um, I, I know that it, it, in terms of its level of sophistication, it far outclasses the schools, uh, the public schools nowadays. I mean, that, that goes without saying. Uh, our only competition which I, when I was in Fort Collins was the IB program at local high school, so, so that's true. Uh, could I go to this lady? Yes. Uh, uh, Ma'am, could you wait on the mic because we are being taped. <laughs> in my experience, which is pretty recently, I'm going back to college, but I notice when I speak to people who are teachers, they say, well, we're mainly teaching for the test. So the high schoolers will pass the SATs and get good scores and go to a college instead of teaching them how to think. And I think what Washington and Lincoln learned and how their education differed is they learned how to think. And um, I'm wondering if there's anything that they could do to change the test so their kids would have more thinking questions? Uh, okay, let me answer that question because you used a lot of terms that are kind of loaded in, in education ease. Okay. Uh, 
Um, if, you, if you go to progressive educators nowadays, public school teachers, they will say that they are teaching students how to think. And they will say that they're inculcating thinking skills. Now, I've never understood what a thinking skill is. In the old days, you just called it thought. Uh, apparently, there's a skill out there of thinking. Uh, and I'm going to find that skill one day and uh, work on it. Uh, the, the problem, the thing that's missing is the idea of actual knowledge that has to be acquired, which is really at the heart of what you're trying to get at by your question. Um, see, it's the, it's the schools that want to talk about the thinking skills, and, they, and they're, 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 they're always pounding, uh, uh, you know, pounding us with the, with the salts of this idea of the global economy, and we're going to be outclassed, and all the rest of it, instead of just going back to what people need to know. Now, the most articulate spokesman on this is actually a man of the left, and that's E.D. Hirsch, who says that there are things that we have to know as a culture to be able to communicate. And his most recent book, he's actually fairly political in this, which he calls The, the Making of Americans, uh, where he says that you know, the progressives have just completely lost any idea of a common culture or civil polity. Um, so you're absolutely right. If there were to be true education reform and there were to be tests involved, um, then we would have to be tested on actual things, uh, actual pieces of knowledge. Now, no one wants to do that, of course. Why? Because then we get into the culture wars. So imagine if we were to have a discussion about what should be the, um, what should be the requirements on such a test. Um, this would be hotly disputed. Uh, we would be told that you know it's anti-poor, it's anti-black, it's anti-Hispanic, so on and so forth, because uh, you know, the, these are just culturally determined things. Um, let, let me give you, because there was another talk I was going to give before I got snowed out today. Let me give you a sample of, a thing, of uh, what would have been on a college entrance test in the year 1888. This is what you would have to know to get into college, a college in the South. History of the United States. You're just given the questions. There are no multiple, there's no multiple choice, nothing like that. How many voyages did Columbus make to America? Give the date of each. Name the 13 original states. Name the wars the colonies were engaged in before the revolution. Name the presidents in order to Cleveland and place opposite the name of each the length of time in, in office. Give the causes of the War of 1812 and the Mexican War. Mention the important facts of the Jackson administration. Name the principal battles of the Civil War and give the names of the principal generals. That's history. How about some geography? Through what waters would you pass in going by steamer from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to St. Petersburg, Russia? Name the principal bays that touch the United States. Ready for some grammar? <laughs> Define the parts of speech and give an example of each in sentences of your own composition. Give a sentence containing a verb in the active voice and then change it to the passive, also a sentence using an infinitive as a noun. Also, sentences showing that the same word may be used as an adjective and a noun. Those are just sample questions of what it took to get into college, a southern college. Can you guess what college? In the year 1888. UVA. How about Georgia Tech? <laughs> I won't ask you the math classes, the math questions you had to know to get into Georgia Tech. More than ciphering beyond the rule of three. So that, those are the things that should be on a test. And the grammar is actually, should be non-controversial. But of course, then you get argument, hit with the argument, oh, this is standard grammar, which is, you know, white male, dead white guy, Lincoln type grammar. You see what I mean? So as soon as you start actually asking, and, and here's my theory about the tests, because I've seen students go through these tests. And these are students at a school where they've been reading Shakespeare and, and Cicero and all these things, uh, you know, for all of the year. We took not one day to prepare for these tests because they were such an insult. And the students would come out of the test saying, what a joke. It was like a day where they didn't have to go to work, right? Um, and here's a, here's a sample question that you would get on one of these tests. So for in the 10th grade, write an essay telling us about a favorite hero of yours. That's it. Well, notice that you could say anybody. You don't have to write on Lincoln or Washington. You could write on your father. Those tests are usually not checked for grammar, right? So, so that anybody can, who is semi-literate can get pretty close on those tests. If you were to have real tests that test real knowledge as a matter of the state testing, 
uh, you would see such a separation between the very, very few good schools, which are almost all uh, charter if they're public, uh, and, and everyone else. In fact, you would see massive failure in the 80s and 90 percentages, 90th percentiles. So we're not going to get a real test. Um, and that's why they, they hate the test so much. We don't want to teach to the test. What, what else is public education supposed to do other than teach to the test? Isn't that how we know someone has acquired something? I mean, you can talk about thinking skills, yes, but to get to, at least to get to a portion where you can think about something that's in a text, you have to know uh, certain facts, right? So, you know, the, the, the tests are inadequate and the tests are merely designed, I think, even though they've been forced on the public school establishment, since they've just been turned over to the public school establishment, they actually hide more than they show us. And that's how you can move into a suburban school district and say, oh, well, they have, you know, the best scores in the area. Well, of course they have the best scores because you're comparing, first of all, to the total social dislocation of the inner city. But on top of that, you know, they come out in the 40th percentile, 50th percentile, most of the kids are passing. You're not worried about it because you think you're safe in the suburbs. If this were a real test, even asking us to cipher to the rule of three, and 95% of the kids can't do it, then we would know the truth about our public schools. Sorry, I got a little warm on that question. <laughs> uh, I, think, I don't know if that clock's right or not. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, this will be our final question. Okay, this, this lady in the, in the back there. President Obama has said that his guiding principle for making decisions is like what works. And I'm wondering, how would you say he defines what works and how does this differ from a liberal arts way of viewing the world? Okay, what works is actually code. Uh, and if you, if you go back and if you look at FDR's uh, administration, he came in saying the same thing. In other words, we're not going to get caught up in principles. We're not going to get up in. We're not going to get caught up in constitutional truths. We're just going to do what works. And this is what FDR said as he unveiled an agenda, which was clearly left of center, which clearly was not working. Um, and clearly uh, bothered any true constitutional uh, scholar in the nation. And what's funny about that, because I spent a little time on textbooks, if you go back and you just read the standard textbooks that deal with the FDR administration, they all say the same thing. Virtually verbatim, they will say, FDR was a pragmatist. FDR just wanted to do what works. That was the rhetoric of FDR. Look at his 1944 State of the Union speech, where he unveils what can only be called a socialist regime um, 10 years into the Depression, more than 10 years into the Depression, and it wasn't working. You see what I mean? And so the rhetoric of Obama is, of course, gonna, we're just going to do what works. What that means is we don't have to do anything that, that looks remotely constitutional. But it's not working. You see what I mean? Um, it's funny, uh, but... Um, Principles are important. I know this lecture series is called First Principles, but when I was running a school, I had some of those type people, even sometimes on, on the board. Uh, and they were kind of, not to offend anyone in the audience, but engineering types, where they would say, oh, let's just fix it. There's a problem, let's just fix it. Let's not talk about philosophy. Let's not talk about principles. As soon as you take the principles out of it and think you can just fix it, it's going to turn into a popularity contest, uh, if you truly believe that, but usually what it's doing is hiding your real agenda. Because I think Obama knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, and that there's no, the, the language of pragmatism, pragmatism is just the perfect rhetoric to trick Americans who one of their great virtues is that they're prag pragmatic. Um, but Americans actually, when they're at their best, are following first principles. In the same way that Link Lincoln said, that he had nothing, there was nothing about his political philosophy that did not go back to the Declaration of Independence. When's the last time we've had a president say that? Well, we have had. I mean, Ronald Reagan said it in our time. Um, but that's not Obama's game. Um, we should, do we read the Declaration of Independence? I mean, this is, this is insane. But I can, but one, of the, one of the sure tests that you can give to your average, almost any public school student coming out of the public schools, is you can quote either the beginning of the Declaration or the beginning of the Constitution, 
just ask them what public document it's from. And they won't know, and they will guess. They'll say the Constitution or they'll say the Declaration, but they will not even know which one it is. Um, so how in the world can we get back to first principles when we, don't, we aren't even reading the first principles? All right, thank you. Thank you for your questions and thank you for attending.